It's been 40 years since Bruce Coburn released his debut record, and last night the Canadian singer-songwriter was honoured by his peers for four decades of music making. The music legend was feted by the likes of Sylvia Tyson, Hawksley Workman, Ron Sexsmith, Buck 65, the Bare Naked Ladies. They all took the stage at Massey Hall in Toronto to perform from Bruce's extensive repertoire of songs, including If a Tree Falls, If I Had a Rocket Launcher, and Lo- Lovers in a Dangerous Time. The event was part of the International Arts Festival Luminati, it's the morning after, and Bruce Coburn joins me live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. <laughs> Nearly alive, anyway. <laughs> were, you, was it, were you up in the wee hours uh, yeah. celebrating yourself? <laughs> yes, that was the peculiar part of it. Yeah, I, I, well, yes, to answer the question, I was up fairly late. But, um, yeah, the celebrating oneself is an odd concept. Uh, uh, that was actually the only odd thing about it all was that, you know, these people are all there doing a tribute to me now and... and you know what am I doing there? <laughs> but it actually, as a show, I thought it worked really well. I thought it was. Uh, I mean, I, I should out myself as I was hosting the show as as well, and I was uh, such an honor to be part of it. Uh, it, was, it was quite an experience, and there was a, a series of. Uh, what I described on stage at one point is Canadian moments where this cross pollination of these incredible artists coming together to do your songs. How? What did you make of this whole exercise? Um, well. A lot of different things, I suppose. I mean, it, it, it's a complicated set of uh, emotional responses to something like this. Of course, I'm uh, excited and and honored by the the attention and by the obvious uh, respect and affection that I was getting from from all the people that were part of the show. Um, you know, I feel like that. Uh, that's not something you can take for granted or uh, or or even work for really mm. you know it's just it was there and it was palpable and it was really nice but at the same time you know I was performing too so I had to be thinking about not screwing up <laughs> which took some of the the ability to kind of just sit back and enjoy it in, into a different place you know so but it, uh, it it was fun you're you're known for so many things Bruce and 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 loved for a lot of things for for your poetry for your environmentalism for your political activism this was really about your songs about mm-hmm. celebrating it's called it was called songbook uh, did that mean something in particular to you to to have people really addressing your music I didn't think about it so much uh, uh, but yeah in fact um, the because uh, you know I've written about a lot of different things I, I feel like my job is to write about life so and that includes all of the, these other elements that you mentioned but um, if people are going to take the broad approach and and which they did last night in in, in terms of choice of material uh it went from the political to the spiritual to the uh, the sexual to whatever and uh and and wild interpretations uh, too from michael yeah. Capinti's uh, jazz interpretation of, of some of your work to to buck 65 doing calling you the first hip hopper you know and yeah, yeah. Saying that you you were you're a rapper in disguise well yeah and the whale and jenny's uh, a cappella version of going down the road was amazing and uh, the uh, and going down the road's a song that has not been heard in public very often other than in the movie of the same title but uh, uh, so that was it was nice to have that one trotted out something that was so special about uh, last night i mean i think everybody who was in massey hall is just packed uh show and and everybody's going to talk about this for years having having been at this thing but w- what made it particularly special was that you performed uh, which is not something that people necessarily do when uh, at tribute concerts uh, especially if they're the center of the center of the attention uh, it was it was a very fine decision tell me about making that decision uh, it wasn't much of a decision. Uh, it was suggested by someone, and I went, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> that was about as complicated as that got. It just, uh, I think that um, I'm not sure whose idea it was originally, uh, but it it uh, when it came to me, it was it was it came as the invitation to be part of the show. So uh, I I was glad. I mean, it's a little weird, like I said, to to be part of a tribute to myself. <laughs> But uh, I think the idea is you're supposed to be celebrate. Well, you're supposed to be sitting in the front row and and yeah, teary eyed, you know, watching yeah, or, or or blushing with embarrassment or, <laughs> yeah. or or not having people notice my big fat cigar. But but <laughs> right, uh, airbrush that out. Yeah, but um, I know it was it, the, like I said that was the odd part. But it was fun. It was. I'm really glad that I did participate uh, because partly because of the collaborations that we got into uh, among various of us. And uh, and partly because it was just a fun show to be part of. Ron Sexsmith, Amelia Curran, the Whalen Jennies, 
I suppose it's not fair to ask you to pick a favorite, but w- was there something that stood out for you last night? Where there, was there a moment where you, that you particularly enjoyed? Different people stood out for different reasons. I mean, I I don't think I want to sort of say that somebody I thought somebody was better than somebody else. I, there were there were lots of moments for me throughout the night from because everybody did bring so much of their own uh, musical spirit to what they were doing. So you know, like Buck Sixty Fives. <laughs> rap versions of those songs and uh, it, w- it worked great but uh and it was quite unexpected i mean i, I knew he was going to do those songs but i had no idea what that would mean but it came off great and um m- you mentioned michael Acapinti's jazz version of an old uh, song called on Boulan. that's another one that doesn't get very much public exposure and uh the playing on that was incredible um but you know i mean everybody did a wonderful job and and there were there were a lot of surprises. Tell me about the decision to get up and do "Lovers in a Dangerous Time" with the Bare Naked Ladies. Uh, that song being their what, what was actually their first top forty hit was doing a cover of your tune "Lovers in a Dangerous Time" after you had already made it a hit. This is back in ninety uh, one. They did this, uh, so they do it the song last night, and you get up and sing sing with them. What was that like? It was fun. I mean, uh, we've it's not the first time we've done that, or at, although. I guess it's only the second time we've done it exactly like that, with the sort of doing their version of the song and me kind of playing along with it. Uh, we've done it a few different ways, but uh, um, anyway, th- that you know, once or twice over the years, that's happened right. before. So, so I, uh, that one I kind of knew what to expect. Although, uh, you know, the, the the bare naked ladies is a slightly different, has a slightly different feel now that there's only the four of them. But the, and then there were four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but they were great, and they did. Uh, in addition to uh, Lovers in a Dangerous Time, they did a song called Laughter from back in the 70s that w- was another one that was really nice to hear, and it, it seemed to suit them perfectly. I love that Ed told the story last night about the fact that when they actually recorded Lovers in a Dangerous Time, they hadn't met you. In fact, they didn't meet you for a while after that. Yeah. Do, do you remember back uh, back in the time, in the early 90s, when they made a hit of this song? What did you, I mean, obviously, you probably liked it for royalties, but but, <laughs> did, but what did you think of uh, this upstart Toronto band doing making well, a hit of that song that that was part of a tribute album that was done at the time by a bunch of toronto artists and and uh that one was the one that happened to catch the attention of radio uh, uh from the album but the whole album was difficult for me at first because um because i wasn't used to hearing people do my stuff and i've compared it uh, this way elsewhere but if anybody out out there, and you would certainly know what this sound is like, the, the first time you hear your voice, your speaking voice coming back at you from a you recording machine, <laughs> right. you can't believe you sound like that. Right, right. So it, having my songs come back at me w- in someone else's voice kind of produced the same effect. It's like, what? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't couldn't grok it. And so uh, it took a while. But after, you know, eventually I, it, I was able to just see it as, as people bringing their, themselves to the music. A lot of what was being played last night, rightly so, were were your hits. I mean, songs that people know, and there's there's quite a few of them in the in the Canadian canon now. Do, is there a song that uh, I mean, be honest here? Is this is there a song that you that you're sick of? Is there a song yes. you know? Uh, Leonard Cohen uh, said last year when we get, had the chance to talk to him, you know, "Hallelujah" should be put to rest for a little while. I'm getting a little, you know, I love the song, but it's a, a bit much now. Do you yeah. feel that way about any of your your tunes? Um, not for as good a reason <laughs> as he has. Uh, no, I I get tired of them from time to time, just from performing them myself uh, and uh, wondering where the lions are. I've been through a couple of phases over the years where I wasn't performing it just because I couldn't really give it anything. But that I find after a song's been allowed to lie fallow for a while, it comes back. There are a lot of songs that I don't do, um, and the, from tour to tour, the repertoire turns over a little bit of the older stuff th- that's around because you know because I forget one and learn another one or or just because I feel the need to give myself something else to do so I, I kind of can avoid that pretty much now rocket launcher was another one that sort of went through that <laughs> but it, it also had other factors involved because of the nature of the song after 9-11 I didn't sing it for a couple of years mm. because it, especially in the states because it just seemed to be playing into the wrong uh, body of popular feeling but uh, right. um, but that you know it's any of the songs that become uh, a, a quote necessary unquote part of a show because of people's expectations it runs the risk of 
becoming boring. There was recently a press release that came out announcing that you're going to write your memoirs. You, you're, you've, you've got a book deal. Uh, now, and I know you're going to say, uh, because somebody asked me to do it, and I said yes, but why did you say yes at this point? <laughs> I can give you a better answer than that. The, the, uh, uh, over the years, I've been approached by a lot of people um, you know, wanting to write my book. Or, uh, I'd like to write your biography, and occasionally a publisher would come along, and, and um, those offers or, or invitations always suffered from, in my mind, being premature. Uh, uh, and also it felt, in the case of people who wanted to write it themselves, it just seemed like this was my book to write. Um, although now that I'm faced with having signed a contract with, with the reality of Writing this book, it's terrifying. I have no have idea you started? how to do it. No, we just the kind of, we don't, we only made the deal a month ago. So right. I, I, I forgive myself for not having started yet. But but no, what's up first before I can even get to the book is a new album, which we're going to start on right. in a couple of days. You're going to have to figure out some sort of regime, I guess, where you wake up for and write for three hours, or yeah, or, and, and then then music, and then <laughs> yeah. I th- I you know I. I asked Michael and Dadji, how do you write a book? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. <laughs> he <laughs> Thank said, you, I just, Michael. <laughs> I, yeah, he said, I said, well, you know, I, because writing songs is one thing. They're short-term phenomena, right? You, you sit down for maybe hours, or maybe it'll take longer than that in bits and pieces to write right. something that is a, a very uh, capsulized version of whatever it is you're talking about. Um, but with a book, uh, you know... Y- I don't have the kind of mind that's good at sorting out, um, at creating arcs and st- sorry for the, uh, uh, at creating arcs and structures and whatever you know. So, uh, and I was lamenting this to Michael. Michael said, "Well, I, I never make anything up ahead of time. I just start writing, and then uh, uh, suddenly a story appears yeah, and characters." I kind and, of feel like you're a storyteller. You know, that's not going to be too hard for you. We'll see. I hope you're right. <laughs> I, I, listen, I would I'd be remiss uh, I, I, to not ask you something about. It. I mean, you, you you haven't been known exactly as a shrinking violet politically over the years, and you, you know you do let your feelings be known and your thoughts be known. Uh, we're sitting here in the CBC. To walk out of these doors right now, this isn't something I've talked about a lot on the show, but it is quite remarkable. There, it, it, the, the building is surrounded by police. There's a giant fence, a sort of Checkpoint Charlie deal happening right right across. This is all for the security preparations for the G20 that's happening in downtown Toronto, uh, presumably to... to Keep keep people out of Toronto downtown. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what, how these decisions are being made. What do you make of all of this? Well, I I think that it's better for world leaders and or their you know the people who actually do the talking in the back rooms that come with them uh, to be talking to each other rather than not talking to each other. So fair enough that they should want to have meetings. Although it'd be nicer if the meetings were more transparent and had more. Uh, uh, you know, more of their decision-making and thought processes was were exposed to, to our view. But uh, and and if you're going to have them gather together, then there has to be security. But I don't think they should inflict it on downtown. I I remember um, when the first of these things, I think at least, happened in Toronto in the '80s, and I was living at Queen and John, more or less Queen between John and not Robert. too far from here. Yeah, right, right, just a few blocks up the street, and. Um, I had to go through checkpoints to get into my own apartment at that time, and it wasn't nearly as intense. Not, it's as it nothing is now, like it is you know? now. I mean, yeah. I'm going to need a passport to get into the CBC. Yeah. They, they've got these special, you know, ID books that yeah. we're going to be using next uh, week to, to literally to get into this building. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 offensive. I think uh, <laughs> I, I said to somebody, it was uh, I can't remember who came up with this now, but it came out of a conversation. But we decided that w- they should have these meetings on that floating island of plastic in the Pacific, you know, like, so they, what? they'll be fa- confronted with the, the results of their decision making and, and, uh, uh, and stay out of our hair. Yeah, I agree with the first part of what you said about uh, that. You know, it's good to have people talking and, and I agree that there needs to be security. Clearly, this is the nature of our world now, but, I, but I, I wonder about this decision to put it here, right yeah. in the middle of your busiest city in the country. I mean, surely there's land that can be used for this meeting somewhere else. I, you know, th- so that it, it does doesn't have to create this sort of fortress, in, uh, you know. Uh, and if it's about showcasing the city, I'm not sure what <laughs> what, what kind of city seeing? they're going to see. You know, yeah. they're going to see. A, it's not like a Obama's in a convertible going down the street and we kind of wave at him, which would be great, yeah. right? I, I had the uh, I had a mildly interesting experience the other day. I was driving here from California, and I 
happened to I had a I'd gotten a parking ticket along the way and I wanted to send a check in to them uh before I left the states for simplicity's sake. So I pulled off the road in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh to uh see about mailing this check. And I arrived in downtown Kalamazoo at exactly the same time as as Obama in a motorcade. <laughs> and so there I was on the sidewalk watching with, uh, with the citizens of Kalamazoo watching someone that resembled Obama go by in a limousine. And, you know, a little further up the line, there was a very armored looking truck that, that looked like a bomb disposal truck or something. And I'm sure that's where Obama actually was because there was a, the, the guy whose profile you could see through the tinted windows of the limo didn't quite <laughs> look right. Right. But uh, he was kind of, you know, waving at the folks. <laughs> Bruce, it's uh, thank you for making the time to come in today. This was a last minute thing. We we rejigged our schedule but, uh, when you agreed last night to to come in and, and say hello on the occasion of uh, celebrating the celebration uh, of of your songs. Uh, before I let you go, one of the things that happened last night that I thought was outstanding was Hawksley Workman doing the song Tokyo. Did you mm. guess, did you see that? Yeah, yeah, just uh, outstanding. Uh, we're going to play that right now, but your version from uh, from uh, 1980. Uh, thank you for making the time to come in. Hey, thanks for the, for uh, having me, and thanks so much for what you did last night. You did a great job. Looking forward to the new record. Thank you. This year? Uh, next year. Early, next year. Early next year. Bruce Coburn, uh, Canadian music legend, celebrated last night at the Illuminato Festival. The event was called the Canadian Songbook, 40 Years of Bruce Coburn. It was recorded for Radio 2 last night, so look for that broadcast in the coming days. Bruce has been with me here in Studio Cube.